The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the final day of uh, this uh, public hearing 11 of the Royal Commission. Uh, I shall invite uh, Commissioner Mason, as always, to give the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> we acknowledge the First Nations people as the original inhabitants of the lands on which this hearing is sitting. Nganga Jokururungu, Kalhurni, Arnungu, Gwaripa, Chara, Ninanja, Joda, Ngora, Nyanganka. We recognise Mejin, Brisbane, Manana, Ngo Kanta Nanye, Ngora, Mejin, Nya, Brisbane Ta. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Durable and Jagera nations, Manana Ngo Kanta Nanye, Karo, Panya Brisbane River Nya, Alanjara Mono, Olparira, Arnongo, Ngorarija, Joda, Ninanja, Mono Kwari, Ninanye, Jurubonga, Mono Jagrona. And we pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Their land is where the city of Sydney is now located. We pay deep respects to all elders, past, present and future, and especially elders, parents and young people with disability. I'd now like to read the First Nations content warning. This hearing will include evidence that may bring about different responses for people. It will include accounts of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of First Nations people with disability. It will also include references to First Nations people who are deceased. If the evidence raises concerns for you, please contact the National Counselling and Referral Service on 1800 421 468. You can also contact Lifeline on 13 11 14, Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636. Or for First Nations viewers, your local Aboriginal medical services for social and emotional well-being support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Mr. Power, I think. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, the first witness today will be Justin Thomas. You will find his written statement at tab 16 of Tender Bundle A. I asked to tender his statement into evidence and for it to be marked as Exhibit 11.33.1. Yes, thank you. That will be done. Thank you. And I uh, call Justin Thomas. And Chair, Justin Thomas will take an oath on the Bible. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Thomas. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give um, evidence. Just before you take the oath, I'll just explain where everybody is. You, I believe, are in the Brisbane hearing room, so you can see Mr. Power, and you will also see Commissioners Mason and Atkinson in the hearing room. Commissioner McEwen is with me in the Sydney hearing room. So that is where we, we are scattered today. Uh, I'll now ask you to take the oath and if you would be good enough to follow the instructions of uh, Commissioner Atkinson's associate. Thank you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Now, Mr. Power will ask you some questions. What is your name? My name is Justin Thomas, and I'm 43 years old, and I'm from a place called Campbelltown in Sydney. And did you give a statement to the Royal Commission uh, that talks about your life experience? I sure did. Now, um, are you a proud Aboriginal man? 
I'm a Derek man from Mob of Clan of Yorra. And have have you recently been exploring, with the help of IDRS, um, your First Nations That's right, ancestors? I believe my grandfather's from Stone Generation. Okay. Now, um, do you have any disabilities? I do. And what are they? Um, brain functioning, um, think, think, thinking. Um, I need help uh, making decisions. Uh, epilepsy. Yeah. All right. And dealing with each of those, um, did you find out, or did you have your first experience with epilepsy when you were about eleven or twelve years of age? That's exactly right. That's a result from my abuse as a, as a child. And but with the intellectual functioning that you've talked about, um, was that known to you as a child, or did you find that out much later in life? I was having brain scans in it that by at that age when first seizure, um, find out what it was. I was put on Epilon five hundred for a while, which didn't do me any good. Um, but I didn't know I had other disabilities. Me having epilepsy until yeah. later in stage. And how old were you when you found that out? You, you, how, how, do you, how old were you in your 30s? when? when uh, you... I'd say probably late 20s I found out I had other disabilities. Go. Right. Now, I'd like to ask you about your advocacy work. Are, are you an advocate for people with disabilities? I sure am because I am... I do a lot of advocacy and motivational speaking, uh, talking to the young generation, um, Aboriginal kids and that. They don't want to fall into the cracks like I've experienced. And is that work as an advocate for people with disability very important to you? Uh, I do it with passion. Uh, you know. And we're going to come back to this part of your life, um, but is there something that's a highlight for you of that advocacy that you've done? It's got me nominated as Australian Delegate in 2019 in the United Nations in Geneva. And uh, did you go to Geneva and speak to, to the UN? I sure did. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned to me that uh, part of that process of being selected, uh, you were in contact, contact with Pat McGee, who's given evidence. That's right, yeah. yeah. Now... The, you've got two sons? I do, a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. And, and do you also have a, a passion for uh, V8 car racing? Yes, as a hobby, um, things to do on weekends and sport get into. Okay. And you volunteer for some of the big V8 car races uh, around Australia? Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to come back, start with your, your childhood. Um, where were you born? I was born in Canterbury in Sydney. Okay. And uh, did you live with your family till you were about 11 or 12? Yes, I did. And then I think from there, docs took me away from family in the end, put me in the ch children's refuge. All right. Which made my trauma trigger much heavier than, than or worse when I got moved away from home. All right. Now, when you were with your family, your your mother and um, your uh, a brother and, and half-sister, um, was there a cultural, an Aboriginal cultural centre that you used to go to as a small child with your family? It was called Tarawal, which is based in Neds in Camelton. Okay. Um, I was more or less um, part of the Aboriginal community of Aboriginal families out there. When you went into a, a children's home, um, was your were you able to keep up that cultural connection, or was that no? It was taken away, and yeah, I, I was never recognised. I didn't have Aboriginal till later in life. Okay, but you remember that connection from your child, early childhood, personal yeah. connection with the yeah. family, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you mentioned about your epilepsy. Is it the case that that epilepsy? started um, after you first went into a children's home? Yes, it, uh, it got worse. Got worse. I had one seizure at school. Okay. 
all the rest was um, escalating. Um, as I was getting older and in juvenile justice centres and that. Okay. And uh, did you did you find being in a children's home very hard? It can be very triggering, um, varies in trauma. And at the time, but then uh, I didn't recognise my own trauma. But I realised that I, I had, I um, never saw my own behaviour problems and I was never... I never had had any kind of help, but I had to fend for myself as a child. And did you run away um, from children's homes to try and get back to your family? I did. I was worried that if I got back to my family, the 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 sheriff or something would come look for me at the mum's door or something like that. Um, so. I end up sleeping on trains and train stations and parks. Okay. And so um, this is as quite a young teenager. You were homeless, sleeping in parks and on trains. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Now, from sleeping rough and, and being on trains, sleeping, did you come to the attention of the police? I did because um, eventually I was charged with trespassing and fair evading and end up escalating a lot of fines and um, <clears throat> I couldn't deal with my fines so they found a reason to lock me up for locking me up for fines, unpaid fines and that and that made me a lot worse. Um, inside me I started resilience and my trauma was getting worse and yeah. Okay. And sometimes when you were arrested, were you held on charges because you didn't have a place to go to? Yes, a lot of times I've been remanded in, in custody because I didn't have a place to go and fix home address or sometimes I've been in there for alleged to have done stuff I've never been found guilty of. And after you turned 18... Um, did those problems continue? They did. Okay. And um, I've always been maintained a target because I was vulnerable on the streets and they continued to approach me and target me. And when, And do you say in your statement that you, you, there was a, a – fell into a bad crowd because you were a young person? I was easily led because my part of my disability – I've been misguided to a lot of, do a lot of stuff, a lot of crime, which I don't intend to do in issue, but I wouldn't have any help. I had to fend for myself, as a, as I repeat. And I had no role model with me either. And so during this time, were you sometimes in boarding houses, um, sometimes on the streets, and then sometimes held in jail? I never had a fixed address. Um, for about 10 to 12 years, something like that. Now, when you were charged and you were um, given paperwork, um, were you able to understand what the paperwork was and what was required of you? No. Um, no, and that's, a, that's where they took advantage of me because they knew they were trying to read me, bail conditions, community service orders, things like that. And other things, and I never understand this. It's never explained to me properly, and I just signed the paper, and that was it. Okay. When you were outside, whether it was the, the prison or the watch house, did you have a problem keeping track of the dates of, of what you were meant to go to? Yeah, because every week I was guaranteed I got a, a search, uh, search warrant, uh, um, a warrant for me arrest because um, power to appease. I've had Numerous failed to appease. Um, I wasn't the type of person to turn up to court because I didn't know the dates. Now, when you... And also were, at that time, my homelessness came into play as well. Now, up to this time, you, they knew you, had, you knew you had epilepsy. Um, uh, when you went into, into jail... Um, were you 
in any special unit or were you just in the mainstream? No, they threw me in main in with the main main criminals then. Um they they used sometimes they used to take my medication off me where I'd go about medication in prison numerous times as well. And so eventually I've gone off my medication for like eight years or so because there's no point them not feeding me in prison my medication when I got out. There's no point getting back on it because the the gap. Okay. Now, while you are in jail, did you have some seizures? I did. Yeah. And what what was the ha- what happened from those seizures? I woke up and I was in the hospital um, getting a, getting another CAT scan on my head. And I've had a swallowed tongue numerous times from the, from the fits. Okay. Um, now, the last time you went to prison was in 2004, okay, and that was for about 12 months? Yes. Was there anything that happened during that, that last time you were in jail? Uh, that w- Yeah, unfortunately, um, I had to say goodbye to my granddad when he passed away in a week later, my, my old son was born, okay. and I didn't get to go to a funeral or um, or give give birth to my son. And did that make you really really sad? That got my yeah. And did you say to yourself, "I just don't want to be in prison again"? I kept on saying that, and I had my nan visit me in the last one, and she prayed for me too, so. With me and my nan still had that connection, and um, but she prayed for me last time, and I really um, told my nan, "This is it." Okay. Now, when you got out, was it still really hard? Even though you had made this commitment to your to your nan, was it still really hard? Uh, yeah, like um, <clears throat> it. It's always been a struggle to adapt back to society after being in prison and, um, yeah, and I find um, I was getting less court court appearances um, when Jane Sanders from Shopfront took over and represented me. So she's, um, she's made a big impact in my change in the way I didn't have a warrant for my arrest. Um, my fines, well, no, I still had outstanding fines, but um, just um, stopped um, failing to appear in court. So she made sure I'd turn up. She picked me up on the day and she'd give me a reminder the day before. Um, she made sure I'd turn up for court. I'm getting a, a few Section 32s on the Mental Health Act. And so Jane uh, Saunders, she was from Shopfront Legal, which is a community legal centre in That's Sydney. That's right. She's still doing it with a passion today, trying to save kids. Yeah. And she, when she took over your case, you've just described how um, she did more than just being a lawyer for you. She helped remind you of court dates. She gave you lifts to court sometimes. That's right. Um, and went through the court orders so that you really understood them and knew what you had to do. That's right. Right. And was she able to be somebody who you could talk to if you had a problem and she would help you sort it out? Yeah. Okay. Now, the other lawyer you talk about in your statement is Peter McGee from um, IDRS. Could you just talk about what, what how Peter helped you? So when um, <clears throat> I got to the age limit for Jane Sanders, she introduced me to Peter McGee from my DRS and he started to appear for me at courts and he's he he's been to numerous court cases with me again and um mind you it's um over small matters but yeah he got well, me at court numerous times but yeah he was all good in the end and um he started um he started to see my behaviour was getting better and um, he, he waived my fines, which gave uh, a bit of ease off my back for a while now. So they, and since that, um, 
they waived, got the fines waived. Um, if I didn't get enough fine, fine within the next five years, and then all the, all the fines would be waived permanently. Okay. And you, you talked about the fines that you'd got right from being a young person. Were they, did you feel that was a real weight uh, on you, those fines? Yeah, it did. It sunk me a lot. And, and, and knowing that um, I wouldn't have any kind of accreditation as an, as an adult because I was still haven't paid those fines off. Yeah. And at the time, Peter McGee helped you get a fine waiver. They were about $8,000 in fines. Yeah. And that was a real weight on you. It was a heavy weight. Yeah. I made three attempts to pay it, but I couldn't pay it all. Okay. Now, after you had had that help and there was you, you, you had finished with jail, um, you became an advocate for people with disability. Um, how did that start? How did you come to that? Um, when Peter McGee was um, leaving IDRS as a lawyer and he's in the next stage of his life, um, he's introduced me to Ben Garcia from... He was um, there. Actually, he took over Rachel Spencer. So um, he was running peace book groups with Jonathan. In, uh, or Jonathan was a student and um, Tina was there. So I found it interesting going every Thursday to the peace book group that they were running. <clears throat> and it actually helped me reflect, reflecting on, on my past and uh, um, make changes. Um, and I was able to get the guidance. Okay. And from that, that being part of that peer support group, um, did uh, was it organised that you would uh, visit some juvenile detention centres to speak there? <laughs> yes, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't that long ago. Actually, I think it was about three or four years ago. I was, I've done some training in the juvenile justice centre at Wagga Wagga. Um, and also in Dubbo. Okay. Now, how how did it make you feel to be someone who was going as a teacher uh, to juvenile detention centres where you had been held as a as a prisoner? How did that make you feel? Um, very fun, good memories. Sometimes it's good to be able to talk, and that the officers would listen. Yeah. Yeah. Having that voice um, and being my advice to be able to do it. And in your statement, you say that um, whilst things are not perfect, there are things look better than they were when you were there um, in terms of art and, and connection to culture. Is that, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but you said to me that um, you, you think there's a lot more work to be done, particularly with police, understanding how hard it is to be someone with a disability um, and and the police should help those people, not just arrest them. Well, I'm saying um, I'm not going to say anything about the kids because it's no fault of their own, but I'll give advice on law enforcement is that you never underestimate a child, you never know where they come from and you don't know what kind of trauma they're bringing and... Um, Please have um, talk to them as like they are. You're talking to your friend, and and kind of be mindful, um, but try and be a role model for kids instead of um, using tactics on kids. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned earlier, or we mentioned earlier, that you'd spoken at the UN. Could you tell the commission a little bit more about what, what you were there for and how that? Um, when I was at UN, um, <clears throat> I actually realised that, and people see this from the other side of the world, is that Australia is the number one country and <clears throat> we should be leading by an example in the world of how we can deal with things and be and be on top of things. And we, and we should be, really, because Australia is, like they say, it's a lucky, lucky country. And we should be appreciating and and living together and working together instead of using tactics on people. Yeah. 
and you were there representing Australian Indigenous people uh, and particularly Australian Indigenous people with a disability in, uh, with the justice system. So what was that? Sorry, sorry. Um, so you were there for two things. One was to be uh, an Aboriginal man and the other was a person with disability who had personal experience with... That's right, lived experience and me being an Aboriginal man. Yeah. Now, I'm going to finish off with things that you think need to change. What are, what are things that you would like um, to tell <clears throat> What I really want to see is that... <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't get to this part. Um, yeah. Let's talk about this. Is that back in the day when I said of my court appearances was Section 32s, I think instead of using that, I think we need to rethink about the CIDP plan um, throughout the nation because, uh, and we need long term funding, maybe review on every 10 years, maybe um, because across the nation, there's disabilities everywhere. And this building of mental health is never going to go away because it's just going to be there for generations. And I think we found that having CIDP would um, save a lot of money and, and a lot of people court appearances by people. So, and if you don't know what that is, it's called Cognitive, Cognitive Impairment Diversion Program, which is very important. Um, and a lot of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people with a disability. Yeah. And you were going through the justice system without CIDP, um, but you were lucky to have these really great people, Jane Saunders uh, and Peter McGee and, and others, and they were helping you similar to what CIDP did but without that sort of program. Yes, yeah, so I, I think in... We need to make that a permanent basing for a strategy in Australia, um, connecting together and working together, like say, and being Australian, and yeah. and that would be a great resources, and um, and it also helps people with disability live to their potential mm. instead of um, instead of seeing them go to jail and yeah. locking them away. And in your statement, you say that. Um, People shouldn't be sent to jail simply because they don't have somewhere to live. Um, is yeah. That right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and another thing too is that um, people like me and my generation falling through the cracks all those years ago, no fault of my own, but I believe that some stage we should have our criminal records pardoned because we need to move on and everyone must, needs to move on to do good things to the communities in Australia and instead of judging people with their criminal records. And it affects my employment, it affects um, a, lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of other lifestyles too. And the last thing I just wanted to ask you about is in your statement you talk about um, training for people in government um, to understand and to, to help people with intellectual disabilities. Could you talk about that? Yes, and that's still yet to do more. But yes, um, we do need the government to not understand uh, people with disability and mental health needs. Um, and is part of that having people like yourself who have that lived experience speaking directly to those people so that they can see through you? That's right. I think lived experience is the best way to go about things, and then they can give you an insight on what's going on with people with disability and mental health problems. And, as they um it's good for United Nations having people lived experience currently and, and tell the inside story. And I think basically it's how we actually can make change together. And I uh, finally should mention in your statement there's a link to the to the film of you giving evidence at the UN. Um so that's that's there on the <laughs> web. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that, and that's something you must be very proud of. I'm very proud and always do remember this day and the day, yep. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Chair, those were the questions I had. Thank you very much and thank you, uh, Mr Thomas. I'll ask the commissioners if they have any questions and I'll start with Commissioner Mason, who is in the Brisbane hearing room with you, and ask Commissioner Mason whether she has any questions. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for coming today to give your evidence, uh, Mr Thomas. And um, so uh, we heard from a young man, a young Aboriginal man here actually last year. Uh, his name is Quaden Bales. And when he was asked how he thinks people should treat uh, people with disability, because he has a disability, he said that he wants people to be nice to people with disability. Yeah, that's right. So I'm, um, I'm going to ask you that same question. Um, how do you think Australians should treat people who have cognitive disability? What What would you say to Australians? Um, don't look down on people. I think we want to be treated even like everyone else. And like I said, it's about being nice and being considerate and um, being open-minded. And, you know, um, in regards to law enforcement, they should be a bit more understanding than what they have been. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Commissioner Atkinson, do you have any questions? I do, thank you. Um, Mr Thomas, thank you for coming in today and it's a privilege to have you here in the hearing room with us. Um, you said when you were talking about going to juvenile detention centres and speaking to the staff and also to the kids who are there, do you want to give us some insight into what you say to them? Say to sorry. Say to the to the staff there, and say to the um, boys who were there. I was uh, I'd never really I've always kept distance from a lot of people because back then it was about me and all about me, and not less people you get involved with, the better it was. So I was kind of like a a caved up thing. I'll only say yes at master or something like that, or hello at dinner time. But that's about it. I've always been the type to keep to myself. So when you go now as an adult, what do you say to the boys? What do I say to the boys? Yeah. Well, actually, as I said, um, from my experience, I wouldn't be talking to the boys. I'd be talking about the law enforcement and the juvenile justice staff is that, you know, because we, for some reason, if you're a survivor like me, a lot, of, a lot of things trigger your behavior and that triggers from the abuse, you know. And so I'm not going to blame kids. Um, I think it's about how law enforcement can make ends meet with the kids and talk to the kids. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, those are the questions I have. Thank you very much uh, for coming, as I said, today to this hearing room. It's been a privilege to have you here. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair. McEwen. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have one question. Mr. Thomas, thank you very much for your evidence. You talked about people like Jane and Peter who helped you through the justice system. How important is it that we have people like them? Do we need more people like that to help people who well, are in this the This is what I recommend for is that we need that CIDP and jazz program run out through Australia, throughout Australia. So we all, us vulnerable disability people, can get that kind of advocate or help within the system because if you don't, things seriously can go wrong later on. And, and the, um, the more we can do things, the, the better our country can be living together instead of being isolating and judging each other and things like that. And, you know, CRTP is probably the best thing going and I recommend it to probably all states should be accepting this CRTP in jazz. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, uh, before we finish, I'll just ask Ms. Finesse, who appears uh, for the State of New South Wales, whether she has any questions for you. Uh, no, I don't. Thank you, Chair. In that case, Mr. Thomas, I add my thanks and appreciation to you for coming to the Commission to give your evidence and for making the statement. 
and for explaining to us the things that you have. It's been enormously helpful to the work of the Commission. Thank you so much for coming. Mr. Power, what are we to do now? Yes, could Chair, could we adjourn till 10.30 uh, for the next witness? Oh, sorry, 10 to Queensland time, at uh, 11.30 New South Wales time. Thank you. Yes, we'll uh, adjourn until then. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, Mr. Coots Trotter, welcome back. Thank you for coming to the Commission once again to uh, give evidence. As you can see, we uh, are at our usual state of complete efficiency and uh, smooth operation. Dr. Thank Mellor. You, Thank you, Chair. You'll find Mr. Coots Trotter's written statement at tab 12 of Tender Bundle C. May I ask for that? A statement to be tendered into evidence at 11.34.1. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. I'll call Mr. Coots Trotter. Thank you. Again, thank you, Mr. Coots Trotter, for coming to the uh, Commission. Just to explain where everybody is today, uh, we have in the Brisbane uh, hearing room, of course, Dr. Malapont, and she is in the Brisbane hearing room together with Commissioners. Uh, Atkinson and Mason, and uh, Commissioner McEwen is with me in the Sydney hearing room and you in a separate location in Sydney. I shall now ask you if you wouldn't mind to follow the uh, instructions of my associate who will administer the oath. Certainly. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Dr. Melifont will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Could, you state, could you state your full name, please? Uh, Michael Paul Coots Trotter. And if you provided, provided a statement uh, to this commission in respect of this hearing? I have. And is that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and ability? Yes, it is. Thank you. Now, you are the Secretary of the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice? Yes. And that's a role you've had since 2019? Yes. And that was when the department was created following New South Wales government changes that merged the Department of Family and Community Services and Department of Justice? Yes. You were previously the Director General, that is from 2013 to 2014, and then Secretary from 2014 to July 2019 of the Department of Family and Community Services. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And apart from your statement, you've also signed a letter to the, to the Royal Commission dated the 2nd of July 2020 in response to a letter from the Royal Commission requesting information about the CIDP. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Just want to go through some background about the program that is the CIDP program and uh, let me know if you agree with these propositions. Uh, it was a pilot introduced by the New South Wales Government in response to recommendations in the 2012 New South Wales Law Reform Commission number 135, which recommended strategies for diverting people with mental illness and cognitive impairment from the criminal justice system? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, I appreciate this was before your time as a as the Secretary of DCJ, but, but do you know why it took five years to get a program up and running from the 2012 recommendations up until 2017? To the best of my understanding, there was a second related report from the New South Wales Law Reform Commission. And at the same time, of course, um, New South Wales was with the Commonwealth um, implementing uh, in a staged way the National Disability Insurance Scheme 
in New South Wales. And I think that those things in combination uh, explain the gap, gap in time between the 2012 uh, Law Reform Commission report and the pilot beginning in 2017. And is the second Law Reform Commission report you make reference to, the 2013 report, People with Cognitive and Mental Health Impairments in the Criminal Justice System, Criminal Responsibility and Consequences report? Yes. Now, um, in the documents we see that there was NDIS transition funding for this pilot that is, that funding was obtained in May 2017 for a two-year pilot by the NDIS Transition Board and then the pilot started in October 2017. Can you assist us by um, a practical explanation of how the NDIS Transition Funding works from your perspective? Oh, of course. Um the NDIS Transition Board was a group of New South Wales department heads uh, that was chaired by me in my role as the head of the Department of Family and Community Services. Um, the funding available to that group was um, authorised by the government through the Expenditure Review Committee, and it aimed to identify um, functions that were needed during the transition into the National Disability Insurance Scheme in New South Wales. Um, so the board was authorised to identify uh, projects of that nature and um, make recommendations to government about their funding, uh, which is what the board did in relation to the Cognitive Impairment uh, Diversionary Program. Okay. And is there or was there a date by which that transition is regarded, transition period is regarded to be at an end, to your understanding? Um, from, uh, from memory, the uh, uh, periods of funding uh, at their longest were three years from uh, 2017 or early 2018, so two or three years as a guide. Okay. Now, that NDIS transition funding ended in June 2019, that's correct? Uh, the decisions to allocate money from that transition funding ended at that point, yes. Yes, okay. Um, and there was actually an underspend for that in that first two years, which could keep the program going with that existing funding for a few more months. In relation to the Cognitive Impairment Diversion Program, yes, that's right. Okay. But um, uh, is it correct to say that DCJ recognised a need for that program to continue be even beyond those extra few months? Uh, yes, we recognised the need for it to continue and we also wanted to try in the second iteration of the program to adjust the way it operated, to try and learn from some of the lessons of the first iteration, in other words, to improve its operation. Um, and I, I should say as well that at that point, it was anticipated that a proposal for a model to replace the CIDP could have been considered by government during the usual course of uh, the budget cycle. Uh, but, of course, um, uh, the COVID pandemic in uh, late 2019 into early 2020 completely disrupted all the usual processes of government decision-making. Right. I, will, I will come back to that, um, Mr Kutztrotter. Can I just come back to this period um, in the beginning of 2020? Was there... Capacity to go back to the NDIS at that stage to ask for more funding for the program to continue? Oh, I, so I, just to clarify, um, uh, although it was called the NDIS Transition Fund, it was New South Wales government funding aimed at supporting the transition into the NDIS in New South Wales. So um, funding for the NDIS is subject to uh, separate agreements between governments. 
So uh, the CIDP was not funded by the NDIA or the NDIS. It was funded by the state state government through um, through its own arrangements. Yes, I'm sorry, it was a very poorly asked question. Was the capacity to tap back into that transition funding to try and keep that program going? No. No, the transition funding was, was uh, there was no more transition funding at that point. Okay. Now, I just want to go through the, the two iterations of, of the program. We'll step through them. The first phase was October 2017 through June 2019? Yes. Okay. And Penrith and Gosford were chosen as the test sites? They were. Okay. Now, um, can I ask, please, that document NSW.0033.0278 0001 be brought up at 0018. Just to orient you, um, Mr. Coots Trotter, this is um, the excuse me. Commissioner, this is at tab uh, 29 of, of D1, and it's the final process evaluation report. Yes, and I'm going you. to, thank you. And we're going to go to page 18. Now, yes. This report tells us that Gosford and Penrith local courts were chosen as both were in year one NDIS rollout sites and each of these locations was expected to have capacity to accept new clients into the NDIS from the 2017-2018 financial year. Does that reflect your understanding as to why these two sites were selected? Uh, it, so my understanding is there were three reasons that Gosford and Penrith were chosen. The first was that, as this uh, document points out, uh, the NDIS was available to people in those locations. The NDIS was implemented location by location in a sequential fashion in New South Wales over a number of years. So firstly, the NDIS was available. Um, secondly, those sites um, represented a metropolitan and a regional site. That was a request, as I understand it, from the then Department of Justice. And thirdly, the statewide community and court liaison service, a service operated by Justice Health to provide support for people uh, with um, uh, mental health and cognitive impairment, was also operating in those two sites. So those three reasons together apparently explained why Gosford and Penrith were chosen. Can you explain to me though the last point a little bit more? Why was that seen to be a benefit that is um, the co-location of the, the statewide service? Uh, I, to be honest, I don't know, but I, it is my advice that that was a, a factor in decision making at the time, but I can't explain it to you. I'm happy to take that on notice if it's of health to the Commission. Um, yes, yes, it would be, and there may be a number of matters for you to take on notice. Um, could you assist me with um, who within the department, and again, you can take this on notice, who within the department have direct operational knowledge of that? Yes, I'd have to take that on notice. All right, thank you. And will. Thank you. <clears throat> can I take it that given that uh, what we see up on screen here was at least one of the rationales for the choice of location, that the availability of and connection with and uptake of NDIS services was considered an important aspect of the program? Uh, yes, I think you can conclude that. And also, um, obviously, um, yes, and, and the ability to, to learn about the interaction between a state service system, the justice system, and a new national service system, the National Disability Insurance Scheme as well. Thank you. And is that aim, 
that objective of uptake, NDIS uptake and, and collaboration, uh, still the case with respect to the proposed Connect to Divert program? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. And, and I'll come back to that a little later. Yeah. Now, I just want to speak about evaluations uh, of the CIDP. Now, in respect of the first phase of the CIDP, um, DCJ commission, commissioned an independent process evaluation, which is the document we were just looking at. That's correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, as well as cost-benefit analysis work, correct? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar with both the, the draft and final reports in, in that respect? Yes, I am. Okay. And I'm not sure, did you get to um, see the evidence of Mr Walsh yesterday? Uh, no, I'm afraid I didn't. Okay, all right. I, I, did read, I, did, I did read Mr Walsh's submission to the Commission, though. Thank you. His statement? Yes, his statement. I'm sorry, yes. All right, thank you. All right, so I want to take you um, to some other documents, uh, sorry, other, other pages within this final process evaluation report. Can I go please to 005 of that, sorry, 0005 of that document? Uh, and can, um, sorry, is there a page reference? Yes, page five. Oh, oh page five. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, got it. Yes. And if I can ask the operator to bring up um, into focus uh, the middle of the page, which starts with the paragraph out of a total. And actually, sorry, just up a little bit further, my apologies, um, to the words in its first 12 months of, oper of operation on the second line of the text. Thank you. So this report reports to government that in the first 12 months of operation, the program achieved significant results in its two core goals of diverting people with a cognitive impairment from the criminal justice system, connecting people with the National Disability Insurance Scheme and other services, and achieved an 87% diversion rate. Is that your understanding of the findings in respect to the first 12 months of this of the CIDP? Yes. Okay. Can I take you please to uh, page 72 of that document, 0072? Yes. Um, you, are you familiar with the conclusions reached um, and set out in this evaluation report? Uh, I've read it, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes to go through some of them because I, I do want to ask some specific questions. Um, so we see a repetition on this page of the conclusion that CIDP is achieving diversion with 87% of finalised matters. Operator, can we go to the next point which in which they found that people with cognitive impairment eligible for diversion are being identified. That is that two thirds of individuals recorded as screened for CIDP in its first 12 months of, of operation were deemed eligible for the program. O on that point, it was an important priority for DCJ um, that um, people who are entering into the criminal justice system do have um, their impairment identified so that that can trigger the provision of, risk of supports? Yes. Okay. And similarly, in the next point, they found that um, CIDP is providing participants with a clinical diagnosis. Almost 25% received a clinical diagnosis for the first time in their life. That was an important achievement from, from the department's perspective. Yes. Um, 
participants are being supported to access the NDIS. Now, I'll just take you to the first dot point because it's relevant for the first and second version of the model. 60% uh, of NDIS eligible participants now have an active implemented plan. That was an important achievement from the department's perspective. Yes, it is. Okay. Next was that CIDP is improving the health and welfare of a cohort of people with cognitive impairment and complex needs. And then we see some dot points under that, that participants who were previously missing, had missed out on services are now getting them. Um, participants could access a range of services to build a network rather than a single source of support. And participants reported feeling respected and valued in a way not previously experienced. What I want to ask about that is that they speak to me as being very significant health benefits. Yes. So when the department was looking for money to try and get the program extended, did it go to health and ask for money? No. No. Not, not to my knowledge. Okay. Do you know? I, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. I, I said, do you know why? Do you know why I didn't go to health? Uh, no. Um, I, I could. No, no, I don't. I could make a supposition, but I don't know why. I am going to ask you to make a supposition, if you don't mind. Uh, because uh, the Department of Communities and Justice had responsibility for the program um, and felt that it was something that we needed to um, uh, deliver within the resources available to us um, rather than uh, the resources allocated to other agencies. Okay, so in the source of this Sorry, in the course of this hearing, we've we've heard evidence from a number of witnesses, and they speak to or advocate for the, the breaking down of silos from department to department, so that the benefits that might come out of something being run by one department is recognized by another department so that there can be a whole of government approach to fixing the problem, and I take by that yep. funding. Yep. Do you agree with the need for that to happen in order for us to, to move forward in a truly transformative way? Uh, yes, I do. Do you, and you may want to have a think about this, but do you from your years of experience within government, have any ideas or insight as to how that might be practically achieved? What we as a commission could recommend that would actually get traction in that respect? Um, so I, I would respond by saying, when I think about the examples of excellent collaboration across agencies. So for example, in the justice system, it might be the youth Koori court, it could be the drug court. Both of those, those um, uh, uh, projects engage staff from health, from education, from youth justice, from child protection, um, to, together with corrective services and uh, on occasion um, other housing, uh, other agencies. So there are really good practical examples where collaboration happens very effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the framework that encourages that to happen is a framework that establishes, where government establishes clear outcomes that they wish to achieve that are broad, but measurable, and then challenges uh, its agencies to find the best way to deliver that outcome, which of course enables organizations like mine to think about how we can contribute to an outcome that also requires the contribution of health or another agency. 
But if agencies are given very, very narrow measures of performance, they quite properly uh, drive hard to achieve those measures of performance. So if the performance measure is narrow, uh, agencies remain quite narrow in their scope and thinking. If the outcome is broader, um, then that does encourage agencies to work together in different ways. Thank you. Can I just come back also to the, the question of uh, look, looking for money when there was a, a call for uh, the CIDBP being extended beyond 30 June? Was there any um, consideration by your department of perhaps looking to call on the some of the prison budget into the program on the basis that if there was investment in the program, then at some point in time that would see benefit to the number of people in prison, that is a reduction? Was that a consideration? Uh well, uh, the consideration was a consideration across the whole of the department's budget, which includes a, uh, a prison system and the budgets associated with that. But um, it, it, you are talking about June 2020? Yes. That's, that's the point. Yeah. Uh, June 2020, um, we were um, the, the usual process of uh, planning for and delivering the state budget had been suspended in response to COVID. The organisation was uh, obviously quite properly occupied in trying to provide essential services during the pandemic. Um, the, the aim with the CIDP pilot was always to try and learn some lessons that would enable us to put a model of diversion to government that was capable of uh, being scaled up uh, beyond two court locations and be made available to um, more people with cognitive impairment in more courts. And we had planned for that to happen through the usual process of state state budget decision making, which was suspended amid the COVID crisis in, in, in 2020. So um, w we had a, a way to approach it, but, but, but COVID obliterated that, to be honest. If COVID hadn't happened, I'm going to ask you to speculate about this. If COVID hadn't happened, would the ordinary process of budgetary consideration have involved or thinking, if we put money in now, then that might actually have um, an immediate, medium and long-term benefit on the numbers of people in prison, so we should be really thinking about that in our budgetary consideration. Would that have ordinarily been done? Or is it the case that it's a more siloed approach, that is, the CIDP program within the particular part of the department was considered in, in that pocket and the budgetary considerations wouldn't have gone so far as thinking more broadly about, hang on, if we do this now, we're going to save some coin for prisons soon, <laughs> mid, later? Um so no, we would we would have approached it broadly because one of the outcomes that the department, through um, in this case the Minister for Corrective Services, has been charged to deliver is a reduction in the rate of reoffending, and there are a range of initiatives inside and outside prisons that aim to achieve that target a 5% reduction in the rate of recidivism. And the CIDP would have been considered, would be considered, uh, along with a range of other initiatives that aim towards that goal. But at the same time, the genesis of this was the Law Reform Commission report from 2012 that identified the need for more effective identification um, and potential diversion of people with cognitive impairment. So it would be seen as a potential contribution to a broader outcome, but it would always be seen as a, um, a targeted response 
to um, some clear and accepted recommendations from that New South Wales Law Reform Commission report. I'm just going to move on to um, the formal evaluation process of the first stage of the CIDP. It's correct, isn't it, that as a consequence of that process, some areas were identified for improvement? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And changes were made in the second iteration of the program to take into account the findings of that formal evaluation? Yes, that's correct. And that included um, removing the court reporting monitoring function? Yes, it did. Okay. And other changes around um, coordinating clinical assessments and support planning, timeliness issues? Uh, the original model uh, uh, was premised on Justice Health recruiting neuropsychologists who would both screen and assess people uh, uh, for cognitive impairment. And the experience of the first iteration of the CIDP was that it was very difficult to recruit and retain neuropsychologists to do that function. And so it took too long for people who needed screening and assessment to get it. So that was that was changed to a different approach in the second iteration of CIDP. Okay. It, all right. Now, I can take you to, to June um, of last year with that funding end date of 30th of June 2020. Even yeah. up to June, the department um, was having meetings with the IDRS, the IDRS. Uh, it, yeah, yes, we were, and also from memory, the um, Council on Intellectual Disability and, okay. and others. Yeah. Okay. And to your understanding, is it correct that even in that last month, a last-ditch attempt was made to try to persuade the Attorney-General to continue funding for the CIDP beyond 30th of June? No, I don't think that's a fair characterisation. The advice that we provided as a department to the Attorney General was that there had been uh, many positive outcomes from CIDP 1 and 2, but the, uh, the second iteration was in a phase of wind-up. In other words, uh, decisions were being made and arrangements made to support people who were current participants in the program. And given the uncertainty of when decisions about budget, uh, the state budget would be made, our recommendation to the Attorney General was not to reverse the decision to wind up the second phase CIDP pilot. But the, the advice to the Attorney General, of course, went on to say there were many lessons that were learned from CIDP phase one, phase two, and that they would be um, drawn on to develop a model for um, hopefully a more effective and larger uh, system of diversion uh, for people with cognitive impairment before the courts. Okay. Mr. Coots Trotter, from the perspective of the department, what were the main objectives that was sought to be achieved by this or any replacement program? What was the interest of the department? Uh, thank you, Chair. It was to, to respond to the recommendations of the 2012 Law Reform Commission report and establish uh, a, a competent service to support um, magistrates in deciding whether someone was appropriate uh, to be considered for diversion and to um, create a service system that uh, screened people, uh, uh, identified where possible from existing records, evidence of someone's cognitive impairment, um, designed and arranged 
a, a plan to put supports around that person so that they could be uh, safely uh, diverted away from, uh, from prison or the justice system and supported in the community. They are means to an end, I would have thought. What was the end yes. from the department's point of view? Uh, firstly, that people who don't need to be imprisoned, uh, people with cognitive impairment who um, are under law have available to them an option other than prison, uh, are, are more likely to obtain that option because uh, obviously uh, it's better for them and evidence suggests that for um, people who are appropriate for diversion, if they obtain that diversion, they are less likely to appear before the courts. So there's a, a, a broader benefit there to obviously the justice system, but the community as a whole. And then in connecting people with cognitive impairment to reasonable and necessary supports through the NDIS, uh, it offers the prospect of people being supported to enjoy genuine inclusion in the community to the benefit of their own health and well-being and um, to the, the broader benefit of the community. Do we find those objectives uh, from a depart the department's point of view articulated anywhere? Um, in relation to CIDP, uh, yes. Chair? Yes. Um, well, the request for Yes, I think you do, and I, I also think that they are they were contained in the um, the process of selecting um, an organ an independent organisation to uh, uh, evaluate the impact of CIDP. So explicit in that was um, a desire to have some analysis of the broader health and welfare outcomes, as well as an impact on contact with the justice system and reoffending. I understand that, but that's ex post facto in a way, isn't it? Uh, an evaluation takes place after the program is already underway. My question is, were these goals articulated with clarity before the program got underway as far as the department was concerned? Um, to the extent the program attempted to deliver on the recommendations of the Law Reform Commission report and that that articulated both, as you say, the means, but also the, the, the reason why you would try and divert appropriately people from the justice system. Yes, I, I think that objective was clear. The choice of um, the Intellectual Disability Rights Service as a, as a provider, again, I think indicated some understanding of what was trying to be achieved. Um, yeah. So the, the aims went beyond reducing reoffending and reducing the numbers of people who would uh, go through the criminal justice system and proceed perhaps to custody. The aims were also to improve the well-being, the welfare, the independence, autonomy of people with cognitive disability themselves. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's what would. Yes. And that is that what the Law Reform Commission said. Uh, well, the Law Reform Commission's report preceded the implementation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and what you've just described, of course, are, is, is an excellent description of the objectives of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So the extent to which CIDP attempted to divert, attempted to divert people from the justice system but also connect them to the supports, reasonable and necessary supports available through the NDIS, it, it is about trying to achieve a whole range of of health, well-being, safety, um, and employment outcomes for people by providing reasonable and necessary supports, identifying those people with cognitive impairment and moving them out of the justice system um, into the community with appropriate supports. Um, I don't want to sound unduly uh, cynical about anything, but it, the choice of two uh, local courts in areas that were going to be covered by the NDIS, were there financial factors affecting the state that were taken into account? In other words, once one 
diverts people into the NDIS who might be eligible for it, presumably there would be cost savings for New South Wales. There may not be cost savings for the NDIS, but presumably that was that a factor to take into account? Uh, no, because um, the NDIS is uh, jointly funded by states, territories and the Commonwealth. And in the areas where the NDIS was implemented, it was it, it involved the full commitment of all of the state's funding for disability services in that area through the National Disability Insurance Agency back to individuals with, with individual support packages. Um, so it was about maximising uh, the services and supports available through the NDIS, and, and it wouldn't have had regard to the um, financial position of the state in relation to disability services. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Thank, Miller. Thank you, Chair. Can I just take you to another topic for a moment? Um, Ms. Coots uh, gave evidence yesterday and yes, spoke yes. about spoke about the approach sometimes taken in the CIDP, uh, which was in part an express preference of the of the magistrates to adjourn proceedings to enable supports to be in place and to be working, so that when the magistrate was faced with it, making a decision about whether or not to grant a diversion order, they could have some confidence that it that it would yep, work. Yep. You see the logic in that? Yes, I do. Okay, and you would regard that as being a meritorious approach in this and in the consistent with the spirit of the intention of the program? Yes, I do. Can I take you please to your letter to the Commission of the 3rd of July uh, 2020? This is nsw.0028.0001. Dot triple zero one at triple zero two. Mm. And I will take you to um, a particular part of that document in a moment. And of course, we are now aware that, of course, there's a, an evaluation, a formal evaluation for the first stage of the program but there was no formal evaluation for the second stage of the program. Is that correct? Yes, that, I, yes, that is correct. Okay. So at the bottom of this page under heading three, the rationale. Yes. Um, and if we could have the last paragraph brought up, please, which commences as noted, a revised model. Okay, so you'll see there that some my issues which are said to be identified with the modified CIDP model are set out. Yes. Where do we where do we look to find the primary source material which identified these issues? So these are issues identified by staff of my department in discussions with um, the uh, Intellectual Disability Rights Service, other government agencies, um, the National Disability Insurance Agency. So there are a, a range of people who uh, our department has been in discussions with. Um, to try and understand the experience of the, um, from the, the perspectives of people about the operation and experience of the second iteration of CIDP. So what I'm going to ask um, you and or the State of New South Wales to take on notice for the Commission is an identification of the source documents which formed the briefing for these three dot points that we see in your letter. You content for that to be taken on notice, please? Yes, certainly, we'll do that. Thank you. Can I take you please to the third 
page of that letter. Yes. And if we can bring up the first paragraph. And so you were informing the commission, um, I, I take it as, sorry, I'll ask the question. Is the purpose of this paragraph in the letter to inform the commission that the the reasoning for discontinuance of the CIDP was based on cost? The decision to um, instigate the second iteration of the CIDP? No, I'm sorry. Um, the decision for there not to be a continuation of the pilot program beyond 30th of June 2020. Oh, okay. Um, cost was one consideration, but um, the points made that you had just highlighted um, was the other. We, we, in discussion with the Intellectual Disability Rights Service and others, thought that there were uh, there were further opportunities to improve on the, the operating model of uh, the second version of CIDP. Uh, but it, it is true that while the um, average cost for clients of the service uh, was lower in the second model of the CIDP, it was still from memory, uh, I think around Four and a half thousand dollars per referral, and so still above the the estimates that were established for the program um, uh, when the first pilot was was put in place. So, there, yes, there's a consideration about trying to get the best value for money, but uh, it's not the only consideration. The other consideration is is the effectiveness of the operating model in in achieving the aims of, of screening assessment and connecting people with cognitive impairment to supports. The, um, the success features that we saw in the evaluation report for the first phase of the program, those features still carried across in respect of the second iteration of the program. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, and the you are sorry, just to be clear, you're talking about the evaluation, uh, uh, the cost benefit evaluation or the process. I'm talking. I'm talking about the process evaluation. So those those conclusions yes, yes. of achieving diversion, identifying cognitive impairment, being supported yes, by yes. NDIS, all of those. We saw all of those benefits continue in the second model. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yes, we did. Can we just and come back to the come back to the costs? Uh, I, I I'm asking this. I thought Dr. Melifont might ask you a couple more questions on this, and I just want to be clear about it. That first paragraph on the page deals with yep. an average cost of thirty-two thousand seven hundred and eighty dollars uh, of in relation to each diversion over a period of the pilot, 2017 to 2020. Have I got that right? That's, yes, that's my understanding, in, Chair, yes. In, in your answer to Dr. Melifont a little earlier, I think you said that in the second iteration of the program, the cost per referral was $4,500. And I wasn't quite my, sure. Yes. I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. Is that the same thing as the cost of a Section Thirty Two diversion, or is that something else? Uh, no, Chair. Um, so th there are a variety of steps in the process. The first is a referral to the service, but um, only a only a share of people who are referred are identified as people with cognitive impairment and then only a share of those people who are so identified receive a section 32 diversion. Uh, so um, the, the figures are uh, referencing um, different things, different points in the process. The referral is at the very front end of the, of the program. 
the uh, successful diversion, of course, is is uh, an output, the, the desired output of the program. I follow that. Thank you. If we go then to the third paragraph, the estimated diversion cost of the statewide community and court liaison service is said to be between yes. eleven hundred and seventeen hundred dollars per client. Is that a reference to eleven hundred to seventeen hundred dollars per diversion or per referral? In other words, is it comparable mm -hmm. to what is being posited in the first paragraph? Uh, I think it's referring to diversion, so the the output, but I don't think it is comparable to, it would not be um, fair or accurate to compare the two programs because the statewide community and court liaison service is something that operates within a day in the court. It operates to a different model. Uh, it doesn't involve um, the same kind of uh, case coordination or case management and follow on as uh, the CIDP in both its iterations involved. So um, it's it's a model, but it's a different model of uh, achieving diversion in this case uh, for well, fundamentally for people with um, have experienced poor, poor mental health. Thank you for that very fair answer, if I may say so. But that means, doesn't it, that the implicit comparison between the first and third paragraphs is inappropriate? Well, I I I, reg I regret that the way the letter is uh, it is uh, constructed suggests that comparison, and so I I completely acknowledge that. And and as I say, I don't think the two services. Well, the two services, in my judgment, are not comparable for the reasons I've outlined. Let me be clear. I'm not suggesting this was done deliberately. I'm just saying the way it reads is that it looks as though there is a comparison between $32,000 and $1,700. But as you explained, that comparison is not really one that is either intended or fair. No, exactly, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to come back to some additional question on 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 cost of the program as part of the reasons for the decision a, a little later. But I want to take you, please, to the next paragraph. Sorry, not the next paragraph. The second paragraph of that letter, which says there are other court-based programs which have similar functions as the CIDP pilot, albeit without all of the same benefits, which are less expensive to run. Can I ask you this? It's to be expected that the CIDP was more expensive given that it goes beyond what those other two programs do and provide by way of support. That's correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And one of the very specific features of the model recognised by New South Wales government was that it did provide intensive engagement with people with cognitive impairments to establish trust and support through NDIS and court diversion processes, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and in fact, um, you would reckon, you recognise and acknowledge that neither the S double C L S or the J A S provides that service for people with cognitive impairment, correct? Correct. Can you help me to understand another aspect of funding, please? The S double C L S is funded through Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network. Now, does that sit? Does that sit within and under your rubric? Uh, no, that is a, a, a function, a division of New South Wales Health. Okay. So, can you explain to me um, how that that funding arrangement? works? 
the funding of the statewide community yeah, the state, liaison. To yes, that. yes. Sorry, maybe I'll ask the question in a better way. Is that service um, funded and operated by health? Yes, it is. Okay. And to what extent is there um, collaboration or integration between health and your department as to that program? I think there's very, uh, in operational terms, day-to-day -day within courts, uh, but both in operational terms, day-to-day -day in courts, and at a, a sort of policy-making, policy evaluation level, I think there's very good collaboration both on um, on this program and indeed the services offered by by Justice Health. Right. I need to get some content around that answer, Mr. Coots Trotter. That is, what is as opposed to a description that is good. <laughs> what is yeah, what yeah. is the actual interaction in terms of policy and policy development for diversion? Um, so I think I'm best to take that on notice, so I can give you a. Um, a a clearer and more comprehensive answer. Um, but taking my earlier observation about the government establishing um, as a goal, um, trying to reduce recidivism, we know that effective diversion in the right circumstances uh, lowers the risk that someone will reoffend compared to um, uh, imprisonment. So while it is a health service seeking to identify people who need mental health services and support, it, by its operation, helps to achieve the broader outcome, the shared outcome of reducing reoffending. So th th there is discussion at a policy level about the, the various contributions of programs within my own department and other departments to these desired outcomes of government. But, uh, but I, as I say, I should take it on notice and give you um, a, hopefully a more a more comprehensive and illuminating description of how things work in detail. Thank you. Can I ask a second part of that, which is th that then how is it determined as between health and justice um, who might ask for it, ask for budget share? Mm. Um, so. Um, the New South Wales government is moving from uh, the more traditional way of uh, funding departments, um, which, which I suppose is siloed, towards so-called outcome budgeting, where um, a, an outcome is is identified, and then resources, not just within an individual agency, but as this matures, across agencies are identified that um, are linked towards delivering that outcome. And you then will, the government's plan, of course, is to move to a situation where um, the outcome is what matters. Um, the contribution of different agencies uh, is, is important, but what is important is the outcome and therefore resources would be moved between activities and interventions uh, depending on the evidence of impact in achieving that outcome. So that, that, that system of outcomes budgeting is relatively new. It is yet to be fully implemented and realised, but it is an attempt to move away from some of the problems you've been describing. Do you have any particular insight as to when that new um, system or approach will be Implemented and realised. Uh, uh, I would take it on notice. There's a there, there are um, uh, timeframes uh, uh, available, and I think published through the New South Wales Treasury. But I'll take that on notice and, and provide it to the commission. Thank you. The so SCCLS operates in 22 local courts across New South Wales, so far as I understand. Is that your understanding? Yes, yes. How, how many yes, are there? How many local courts are there across uh, the state, approximately? Uh, there are uh, around 160 local courts, but um, uh, a, a much small uh, and and but many of those courts uh, are very low volume courts. Very few matters are heard there, 
Um, there's a, a, a small number of courts account for about 75% of the volume of criminal matters through the local court system in New South Wales. And the state uh, community and court liaison service uh, is located in, in uh, high volume courts. So it might be 22 locations, but it would be a much larger share of activity than 22 compared to 160 courts suggests. With respect to the program or programs currently under consideration, um, that is, for example, Connect to Divert, what is in contemplation in terms of how many courts that, that is to operate in? Um, that is still subject to finalisation. Um, uh, there was contemplation over a number of years, a, a scale-up over a number of years for it to operate, I think, from memory um, uh, in eight, 18 um, busy courts. Um, but as I say, the, the, the business case for Connect to Divert is being finalised because it has as, as a key input the evaluation of the Justice Advocacy Service. Um, which was only received, I think, the final report was received on the 4th of February. Okay. And is what in, sorry, is it in contemplation that it will be co-located with the, with where the SCCLS um, programs are um, in place? I, I don't know that for certain. I'm happy to take that on notice and confirm it for you. All right. Thank you. And... Just before we move off the SCCLS, as you state in your statement, it's designed to support diversion of people with mental health needs. Do you know whether that includes personality disorders? Uh, I don't know with certainty, and I'm, I, again, could take that on notice and confirm it for you. Thank you. But it's your understanding that if you're a pe person with cognitive impairment or cognitive disability, you're only eligible for assistance under that program if you have an existing diagnosis of the cognitive impairment or disability and a coexisting mental health need. Is that correct? That is my understanding, but I, again, would need to confirm it on, okay. uh, on note. Yeah. Okay. And building on, on that, even with those things, it's only if there's service capacity. Yes, that's right. And so to your understanding, is it the case that sometimes provision of support is not given to people who fit that criteria um, on, on the basis of lack of capacity or lack of resources? Um, I... Obviously, uh, the service is available in 22 courts and so is not available in other courts. So um, clearly, if someone who needs the service appears before a court but a service isn't available, they don't get access uh, to the, um, the, the, the constraints that apply to uh, in the 22 sites. I don't know and I could, I could seek information and, and respond on notice. Thank you. In your letter, so this is back to NSW.0028.0001.0003, at paragraph three, you speak about that service as resulting in, quote, reduced court contact for participants. Just trying to understand what that phrase means, reduced court contact. Is that a decrease in recidivism or is it something else? Uh, it would be broader than um, recidivism. Um, it, it would be um, contacts of, of all, all types with the court. And do you, um, do you know or can you take on notice what the primary information is for that statement about um, reduced court contact? I'd need to take that on notice. Thank you.
Uh, now, just a couple more questions on, on this topic, and I do appreciate it comes on to health, but um, we, that is the Commission, are aware of a study conducted by UNSW published in 2019 looking at New South Wales court diversion um, for those with psychotic disorder and its re-impact on re-offending rates. Yes. Um, and it speaks about 26% receiving diversion and 74% receiving punitive outcomes. Are you aware, are you aware of any um, study within the government that looks more broad, broadly at the effectiveness of that service? Of the statewide community and court liaison service? Yes. Uh, no, I'm not, and I, I would need to take that on notice. All right. <laughs> Mr. Curtis Trotter, can I, can I ask you this? In our earlier exchange, I think uh, you helpfully identified the objectives of the pilot program. They included uh, maximising the use of the diversion option within <clears throat> the legislation so that <clears throat> people with cognitive disability were not, are not dealt with in the criminal justice system and thus not subject to imprisonment, but rather diverted into um, other programs and other ways of dealing with their complex issues. And also the object of the pilot scheme, as I understood your evidence, was to improve the quality of life, the independence uh, of people with cognitive disability, primarily through assisting them to get the, the assistance available under the NDIS. Is there any program yes. within is there any program within New South Wales which, in your opinion, seeks to attain those objectives, which were the objectives of the pilot program? Uh, no, neither the uh, uh, statewide community and court liaison service nor the justice advocacy service um, are directly ad ad address those objectives. In the absence of the in the absence of the CIDP, there is a gap in doing that. Thank you. Now, I appreciate, of course, that you cannot commit the state government to funding. I understand, I think, the, the difficulties associated with that. But just putting the funding aside for one moment, do you agree that it would be a very good thing for New South Wales and for people with cognitive disability to have a program that sought to achieve the objectives we have identified? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you. I want to move on to the uh, JAS, and as you've indicated, yes, provides yes. Uh, you regarded as providing an essential service to people with cognitive impairment, whether they are witnesses, defendants, or victims, to exercise their rights and participate in the legal process. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not primarily a diversion program, correct? No, uh, it, it's it provides a reasonable adjustment for people with disability in contact with the court. Okay. And you've spoken about having received an Ernst and Young 2020 evaluation of JAS. Uh, it's very positive, isn't it? Uh, I've, as I say, I've, I've, not, I've not read it fully. Um, uh, yes, it, it is positive on my, my early reading of it. Okay. And you've, in fact, just extracted some of the key findings of it into your statement, which was provided this week. Yeah. Uh, and they, that's at paragraph um, 43 and 44, which is yes, SGAT.0322.0001.0011. Yes. Okay. Now, paragraph 43, it sets out that um, the aims the program achieves, and at 44, one key finding was that clients suspects and defendants with a cognitive impairment supported by the JAS were less likely to be found guilty and more likely to receive a Section 32 diversion order. That's your understanding of the finding? Uh, By that's answer. A, a, an aspect of the findings, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, when will a decision be made about whether funding for JAS extends beyond 30 June 2021? Um. Certainly within 
uh, between now and uh, June, but uh, we have not yet had an opportunity to present this evaluation to the Attorney General. Um, we will be doing that promptly. Um, and so uh, we're, we're conscious of the fact that a decision about whether or not to continue the Justice Advocacy Service needs to be made ahead of June um, because the program would have to scale itself down if there was no ongoing, ongoing funding. So from a department's perspective, we will try and uh, equip government to make a decision in the next couple of months. And it's correct that JAS provides, apart from providing uh, assistance to people with cognitive impairment who are suspects or defendants, also provides assistance to people um, who, who, are, who are victims of crime or witnesses, witnesses for the prosecution. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, were you able to listen to or have you read the evidence of Ms Coots from yesterday? Um, I have read some of the evidence of, of Ms Coots from yesterday and, I, and I'm afraid I didn't have a chance to listen to what she had to say. No, that's okay. I, I just needed to know how much to put to you in terms of context. Yes, yes. She, she spoke, um, and of course, very respectfully about the challenges that her service faces not knowing if funding will continue. Um, and she included within those challenges um, that even staff start to look elsewhere. Yes. And they are at this point in time starting to look some thinking about looking elsewhere because there's no funding decision by now. Yes, I, I, yes, I, 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 I'm familiar with that dynamic. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, well, you'd accept, you accept you'd accept that as a valid concern. Absolutely. And. and that to lose good and good and experienced staff is not good for people with cognitive impairment or for the community at large. No, that's right. Okay, what what can be t done? In your experience, your insight about the timing of government decision maker, government budget decisions, so that services like the IDRS know well in advance of the end of financial year whether they will continue to get funding? What can be done? Um, well, usually the cycle of, of budget decision-making sees decisions about the budget beginning in July being made between February and April. That, that tends to be the cycle. Um, so that there is from time to time the sort of pressure and anxiety that I'm sure um, some staff of the IDRS are facing. Um, in its last budget, the government did, in relation to our own department, for example, provide um, uh, guaranteed uh, four-year funding for a range of um, the human service systems, so the specialist homeless service system, a variety of family support services. So. It is an issue understood by political decision makers. They appreciate the practical challenges for non-government organisations if they don't have funding funding certainty. Um, but equally, in in some areas of social policy, um, because of a um, a lack of evidence, uh, there are experiments. There are there are pilots that are time limited that are evaluated um, that have uh, no ongoing certainty, but are necessary things to do in order to build understanding, um, determine what works best, and enable governments to make better informed decisions. So, it, it, it's um, the, the issue I think is understood by governments, and by and large, they do what they can to accommodate those kind of pressures. But it's not always possible to do so. Let me get a little bit more specific, Dan. JAS has been around for quite a long time now, correct? Uh, initiated in 2019, I think, yes.
Yeah, that, the, it was the expansion of that program occurred in 2019, but it was in existence before then. Yes. Yes. Okay. If the political will is there, is there capacity within the department for the budget decisions to be made earlier? Um, look, it's a decision for government. Government okay. can, yeah, it's a decision for government. Thank you. All right. Might just go for another five minutes or so, um, Mr. Coots Trotter, and then take a short break. I want to take you, please, to paragraph 37 of your statement. Yes. Okay. So what you set out here is that if the Connect to Divert program is adopted... Yes. ..what the anticipated features are... Can you tell me, please, what's different, if anything, about what's contemplated for the Connect to Divert program compared to the CIDP? The second iteration of the CIDP? Yes. Yeah, I, I think the key... The key area where we are trying to get um, better clarity of roles is um, the, the role of, um, in this instance, the Intellectual Disability Rights Service in providing um, case management and the coordination for people with cognitive impairment of a whole variety of support services um, that they need with the role that um, under agreements between governments to establish the NDIS is clearly a function and a responsibility of the National Disability Insurance Scheme to provide um, specialist support coordinators. So specialist support coordinators aim to be people who are um, who uh, are funded through a participant's NDIS package, where the package um, uh, involves a, a broad and you know, valuable range of complex but necessary support services. So there, there's a, a degree of sophistication and capability required there to coordinate the services that are funded through the package. And that is a role that, that that is properly the role of the NDIS. And what we are trying to achieve here with our colleagues at the NDIA is um, uh, a, a maximization of the proper roles of the state government and state services and the proper role of the N NDIA and its NDIS uh, specialist support coordinators. Okay. How are you trying to do that? By having clarity about uh, the the expectations of that role, and I guess at a at a very operational level, um, ensuring the N NDIA has available um, sufficient and expert um, uh, specialist support uh, coordinators, and that there are good operational protocols in place to enable. Um, that, that partnership to be formed. And I, I should stress that um, if there was a decision of government to fund Connect to, Defer, Connect to Divert, there is still a, a, an, a really critical process of, sort of final design, both with the National Disability Insurance Agency, but most importantly, with people with cognitive impairment um, and their representatives or organisations that support them who, are, who have contact with the justice system. So the, the, the principles are outlined in my, my statement, um, the sort of operational design, but it, there is still a level of more detailed work to be done 
to, to, to maximise the different roles of the NDIA and, and state agencies. So at what level are these discussions happening? That is, at what level of New South Wales government and at what level at NDIA? Who's talking to who? Uh, so within my department, it's a team, uh, and forgive the public service jargon, led by a director. Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an executive. Um, and so it, it is a person authorised to um, and capable of, of um, having... Uh, negotiations about how an operating model would work and and who does what within within that arrangement. Um, but if you if you want all fine grain detail, I'm really happy to take it on notice and provide it to you. Thank you. And at what level do you understand um, the engagement is coming from NDIA? I'd need to confirm that uh, okay. on notice for you. And when did these negotiations start, and when is it? expected they might come to fruition? Again, I'd need to take that on notice, but there's been um, really quite quite regular, I wouldn't say constant, but very regular discussion between uh, all, all, all agencies and um, IDRS and other organisations through the various, through the two iterations of uh, CIDP and since June 2020 in trying to develop a model to build on the, you know, the, the, the lessons and the many successes of uh, CIDP. So apart from that um, issue you've identified, which is better clarity of roles um, as regards case management and coordination and that specialist support coordinator function of the NDIS, is that the only... Um, uh, change well, I, I or difference from the CIDP? Uh, the other challenge to resolve is um, the first version of CIDP had problems recruiting, retaining, and therefore getting access to neuropsychologists. The, the second iteration of the CIDP brokering, um, uh, providing the IDRS with the capacity to purchase those assessments, in, improved upon that, but they remained there remain challenges with that that meant that people who needed an assessment waited too long to get one. So I'm sure that that is another focus of um, this this latest iteration and an attempt to, to resolve some of those challenges. Okay. And can you take on notice for me, please, who has the greatest operational knowledge, planning knowledge in respect of identifying features of the current Connect to Divert program and certainly. contemplation compared to CIDP? Yep, certainly. Dr. Melifon, could I just ask a question uh, to Mr. Kurt Trotter on that? On at clause 59, 60, 61 and 62 of your statement, you talk about the justice liaison officer. Can you explain and help yes. me understand the interface between those roles and what you've just described about support coordination mm. uh, thanks commissioner so they they are a relatively new feature this is these are roles that have been put in place by the national disability insurance agency um, uh, or progressively nationwide and their, their function is um, to work with um, the system the justice system to try and identify these kind of um, systemic in issues and challenges in the interface between the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the justice system. So it could be about um, how we better facilitate um, the connection between participants in the NDIS who, who may be incarcerated, who are then transitioning back out into the community and need to have their plan reassessed. How does that, how does that best happen inside prison system, how do you best support the transition of people in that circumstance from um, primary responsibility of justice to the community with the supports of the NDIS. So it's, it's a focus on um, systemic uh, operational improvements, obviously informed by the experience of individuals, but it, it, 
it's it's a it's a sort of systemic operational improvement that is the, the chief objective of those roles as i understand it okay and just so that i understand more is that more of a collaborative relationship between your department and the ndia it's an attempt to deepen that collaboration yes absolutely okay thank you so just quickly picking up on that that topic so the jlos don't provide assistance directly to the people with disability but rather training and assisting those working within the system yes and trying to identify these these systemic issues across the boundary between a, a, a state service and the ndis okay and four out of the five intended jlo positions have been appointed is that correct uh that's my advice yes have you been told by the NDIA when you'll get the fifth? No, but um, we're very enthusiastic for the appointment to be made because they're, they're very valuable roles. Is five enough for the state? Um, in truth, I don't know. And I, I think in fairness, um, they are a relatively new feature and it could be too early to tell. Um, I could take that one on notice and seek advice from people who are um, uh, might have a more informed view within my agency, if you'd like. Thank you. Appreciate that. I appreciate also your homework list is getting long. Can we please, Chair, have a very <laughs> short break, five minutes or ten minutes at at this stage? How long are you going to be with Mr. Cooch Trotter? Well, uh, I think probably another 20 minutes or so, but I might be able to rationalise my examination plan with that break. Uh, Ms. Vanessa, are you likely to want to ask Mr. Cooch Trotter any questions? Uh, no, I'm not at this stage, Chair. Yes, I appreciate that uh, the questioning has finished. Thank you for that. All right. Well, what I suggest is that uh, we adjourn until um, 10 past 12 Queensland time, 10 past 1 Sydney time, uh, with the expectation, Dr. Melipont, that we'll conclude with uh, Mr. Cooch Trotter very close to who. 12.30 Queensland um, time. Yes, thank you. If you don't mind, thank Mr. Coach Trotter will take this short break and hopefully you'll be able no, of course. to get away. No, thank you very much. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, thanks, Mr. Cootstrotter. Yes, uh, Dr. Melifon. Thank, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Atkinson has a question. Thank you. Uh, I should perhaps have asked you this a long time ago, Mr. Cootstrotter, but I missed the moment. You agreed with the Chair um, some time ago in the questioning about the value of having a diversionary service, such as the with the objectives of the CIDP throughout New South Wales. Yes, I haven't yes, uh, yes, misstated yes. that. No, no. Um, now, of course, we live in a federation and, of course, the NDIA has added uh, a layer of complexity to that. But, in, in fact, our criminal justice system exists in the states and territories on a state and territory basis. Can you think of any reason why the value of having a diversionary service like the CIDP would not apply to every state and territory? No. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, you, thank you, Commissioner. Can I have a document NSW.0033.0007.0001 this is a briefing note to the Attorney General in respect of the cessation of the Cognitive Impairment Diversion Program date stamp, 15 May 2020. Yes. Thank you. And if we can go to the last page momentarily, dot zero 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 four. This is a document that you approved to go to the Attorney? Yes, it is. Okay. And in so doing, you were endorsing the contents um, of it. 
Yes, I was. Okay. And um, do, does it set out um, a briefing to the Attorney General uh, recommend it, um, in, in respect of the cessation of the CIDP? Yes, it does. Okay. And do we see on the first page of it, please, 0001? that um, in the key facts at the fourth and fifth... Be, I'm sorry, could that be expanded? Is that possible to uh, that, focus on particular bullet points, perhaps? Yes, Chair, about to do that. Can we have the fourth and fifth points, please? CIDP model is costly. We can expand at the, the fourth and the fifth points, please. Thank you very much. And so two of the key facts put to the Attorney General in respect of the recommendation for cessation of funding was that it was costly, resource intensive and not scalable statewide. The services provide replicate services provided under NDIS and CIDP costs 4,600 per client, which is four times more than the cost per client for the SCCLS. You'd agree that there are two reasons put to the Attorney General? Yes. And going over to the next page, 0002, under the heading cost-benefit analysis, in the second paragraph, however, a cost-benefit analysis, you'll see here there's reliance upon the second of the cost-benefit analysis um, conducted by the analysts in support of the recommendation. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the the cost benefit analysis and economic considerations were really prime drivers in the reason for cessation of the program. Is that correct? Uh, they were among the considerations. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can I suggest you they were significantly weighted in the consideration? Um, well, as the briefing note outlines, there were a range of um, issues with the uh, model of operation that were improved from CIDP1 to CIDP2, but we aim to improve further with a better model to replace CIDP2. To your mind, was there a consideration of more weight in this process than the economic considerations? Um, the financial or economic analysis uh, obviously was an important input, but the views of uh, and experience of people who participated in the two programs um, as well as the views of stakeholders and indeed the department are uh, 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 also considerations that there is a need for, a, for an effective mechanism to identify and divert appropriately people with cognitive impairment. Um, the background to this, of course, is that the department's working with, with disability sector stakeholders, with other agencies, with the NDIA to... Uh, develop a uh, an improved model, connect to divert, that we have, uh, will put before government. Um, so it's, it's it, it, I suppose I'm trying to draw the distinction between um, the, the, the need to have an effective mechanism for diversion and support, and then what we learned from the operating experience of CIDP1 and CIDP2. Mm. Is one of the considerations for the potential new program connect to divert that it will be less costly than the CIDP? Is that the goal of the one of the goals of the connect to divert program? Uh, well, it would be desirable, and one way of uh, that there's the lessons learnt uh, from CIDP itself, but also the Justice Advocacy Service 
what, while different to a diversionary service, is very complementary with a diversionary service for people with cognitive impairment. Um, th there's, there is an opportunity there, we think, in concert with um, uh, various stakeholders to think about bringing those two things together um, in within Connect to Divert so that you could um, both uh, maintain the, the quality and reach of justice advocacy, um, but reduce the total cost of a justice advocacy-like service and a diversionary service to replace CIDP. And that thinking assumes the continuation of the JAS beyond 30 June of this year, does it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. In, in it, either as a standalone initiative or as part of, uh, ultimately as part of, uh, of Connect to Divert. Okay. I want to take you to just a couple more topics before I finish up by 12.30. Um, you. Your statement says that the tender documentation uh, required the analysts that is, the analysts who are doing the cost benefit, to include the health and welfare benefits? Yes. Okay. And do I take it that the tender documents included that requirement to take into account health and welfare benefits because that was considered to be an important consideration? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, paragraph 34 of your statement says that comments on the second draft of the cost-benefit analysis supported the inclusion of more benefits to the analysis to support a better cost-benefit ratio and a more robust overall analysis. And this included offers to provide specific research articles and assist with further data provision. Um, I suspect you'll need to take on notice what research articles and what further data was being offered. Or can you answer that here? I, I, no, I can't. I will need to take that on notice. Thank you. And, and in doing so, I'll ask you please to see whether Professor Baldry's work on the cost of criminalisation was part of the research which was offered. Now, your statement goes on to say that the analysts were una unable to attribute health and welfare benefits due to the unreliability of estimations and the lack of baseline data. M my question is why, in circumstances where the analysts did not, for their stated reasons or, or otherwise, did not take into account health and welfare benefits and the department thought that was important. Why was there reliance upon that cost-benefit analysis when briefing the Attorney-General in respect of the decision to cease? Um, so I, I, I think in fairness, the briefing to the Attorney-General, and I take accountability for it, would have been improved by adding in that very observation. But I would also say that the work to identify the costs and benefits of a model to replace CIDP is um, absolutely does seek to identify and quantify a range of health and welfare benefits that would flow from such a diversionary program. Can I suggest to you that the that there was really, it's more than really just identifying that feature. The, the, the recommendation to the Attorney General has the heading cost benefit analysis confirmed that the pilot CIDP model expensive and limited throughput. In circumstances where cost benefit analysis didn't take into account health and welfare, benefits and, the, and you wanted it to, the department wanted it to. That's a real problem, isn't it? Um, I, I think um, in hindsight, we, we, the department, should have been more directed for demanding of the organisation producing the evaluation. Um, they took the view they took and I, I'm sure it was reasoned and grounded, but 
um, given what we know about the broader benefits beyond uh, those justice system benefits, uh, I think we should have been more insistent in trying to include a better assessment, albeit a difficult to quantify assessment, of those health and welfare benefits. Th thank and we you. Certainly, we're, we're certainly doing that with the connect to divert work. Mm. Can I ask you also, Mr. Coots Trotter, um, how precisely, sorry, how, comma, precisely, comma, was a dis disability lens applied to this decision maker making? That is, how did the department take into account the human rights of the persons with disability who are getting the benefit of this program in deciding to cease it, including deciding to cease it at that very difficult period of everybody's lives, the COVID pandemic? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. There are a range of, um, a whole range of um, interests, uh, human rights interests, other interests that the department has to try and balance each and every day in our operations. And um, our response to, to some of those is, of course, imperfect. And there are difficult decisions and trade-offs. But our, our aim always through this was to establish, and our aim remains to establish an effective uh, mechanism for diversion away from the justice system for people with cognitive impairment. Um, we we initiated the, well, the then Department of Justice initiated the CIDP. We extended it to try and modify its operation to better demonstrate or, or learn its impact. And we have worked uh, with other agencies inside and outside government to put another model, uh, we think an improved model, in front of government for consideration. So um, uh, it's, that's not a, not a crisp answer to your question, but we are, we are, we're dealing in worlds of difficult trade-offs each and every day of the week, I'm afraid. And Mr. Kutrotter, it may be that there is a document which does record as part of the decision-making process within the department that a specific disability lens was applied. If there is, I, I haven't seen it, but if there is one, we'd be very glad to receive it. We have received thousands and thousands of documents. It's possible I've missed it, but if I could ask you to take that on notice, please. Certainly. Thank you. The, the feedback from the analyst about a lack of baseline data Were you or are you of the view that there is a base of, sorry, a lack of baseline data robust oh, and uh, complete enough? Uh, yes, and it's 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 an issue that's come up, I, I know, in, in a number of hearings of the Commission. Um, and it is, it is an issue uh, both within New South Wales and nationally, which in part is being addressed by the National um, uh, Disability Asset Work between jurisdictions. And in, in addition to um, the work of, of that group, what is, um, so far as you're, you are aware of, your department doing in terms of increasing data capture and analysis for people with uh, cognitive uh, disability engaging in the criminal justice system? So um, I think, as uh, as pointed out in Professor Baldry's evidence, uh, actually my, my my colleagues in corrections uh, in New South Wales have for a long time built a, a capacity to screen on entry um, people into the uh, into the prison system uh, to try and uh, then. Uh, initially screen and then identify people with disability, uh, including intellectual disability and cognitive impairment. Um, the department under our Disability Inclusion Action Plan is trying to build the capability of our frontline workforces uh, in child protection in housing and homelessness to be able to better screen people who may have uh, disability. 
um, may have cognitive impairment or intellectual disability, and we have a range of um, functions inside the organisation that can provide more specialist assessment uh, to support frontline staff who might who have identified someone they think might be a person with disability in need of additional supports. Yeah. So Different. that 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 process will will build a better quality of uh, administrative data uh, from which you can begin to make better decisions um, as a as a policymaker about the experience of people with disability in various service systems and their access to services, their access to responses, and most importantly, the outcomes achieved. The timing for that? Uh, so the National Disability Data Asset Work um, has a published time frame that I, I will take on notice and, and respond to, but I do know the, the, the justice element of the work which New South Wales is involved in aims to report between July and September this year. Uh, the work inside our, our organisation is ongoing. It's a process of, of, of uh, ongoing improvement. Okay. Now, I just want to check a couple of things about timing, please, see if I have a correct understanding. Was the intention that CIDP clients would transition to Connect to Divert, that is, the initial plan was that Connect to Divert would be up and running by the 30th of June 2020? I will confirm that on notice. That's my, that's my understanding. Okay. And can I ask you please to have a look at um, nsw. 0033.0047.0001, which is in F3 at tab four. Sorry, I'm back, I'm back to this briefing notice, and I just I should have asked you this before. Can you go to triple zero three, please? Can we bring up the paragraph risks, contentious issues? I'm going to read that into the record. I'm going to ask you what the last half of the last sentence means, or what you understand it to mean. The, the recent incidents of persons with a MHCI, that mental health or cognitive impairment, and the CJS mean that there is a higher focus on this area of DCJ operations. There may be mixed community sentiment on diversion of persons alleged to have committed offences. This will be addressed through the C2D program design and eligibility, but can also be mitigated through the gap analysis to ensure preventative supports are in place. What's that mean? <laughs> um, I take that to mean that just as magistrates um, want to know that the necessary supports are in place for a person they're considering for diversion, that that is, an, is going to be an, an issue of interest in the broader community. If someone's um, uh, before a court um, and they are then diverted rather than being dealt with under law, that both the magistrate and the community needs to have some confidence that um, one of the issues and interests in that decision, community safety, is is adequately attended to. Okay. My last two questions, and then I might, um, if you're agreeable to this, Mr. Coots Trotter, um, just provide some additional ones to. Uh, to your council and, and Crown solicitor, given the time. Uh, paragraph 36 of your statement says that the department, sorry, withdraw that. In terms of the Connect to Divert program, if it goes ahead, what's the earliest time you think we'll see it on the ground and operational? Um, uh, late, late, late this year, year. October. October. Like why October? The, the because of the work to finalise the operational design with dis, uh, people with 
cognitive impairment, their representatives, the NDIA and others. And I uh, offer that based on advice I've read in preparing for this hearing. Okay, thank that's, you. That's the view. That's, yeah. Okay, I should clarify my question to make sure we're on the same page. By operational, I mean service providers engaged by the by the department and actually in court starting to do this. That's October? Yes, I think, yes, up and running based on the advice I've seen. Okay. And paragraph 36 of your statement says that the department is developing options for alternative programs for defendants with cognitive impairments. And you speak about one such alternative being... Uh, the connect to divert. Are there others? If so, what are they? Um, I think the, the issue is whether the Justice Advocacy Service is incorporated into connect to divert or whether the Justice Advocacy Service is separate from it. I think. I think that's the, that's what's meant by that, but I will uh, confirm that uh, on notice for you. Thank you. And is it your expectation that decision making with respect to that will also be with well, prior to October? Yes, absolutely. But, but as we discussed earlier, obviously um, a whole variety of people, including the Intellectual Disability Rights Service, would, would welcome an, an indication on that much sooner. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I see I've gone over time, but I will stop now. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Dr. Melipont. Uh, Mr. Kustrotter, I'll just ask uh, my colleagues whether they have any questions for you. First, I'll ask Commissioner Atkinson. No, thank you. Commissioner Mason. No, thank you. And Commissioner McEwen. No, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kustrotter, thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll assume that, Ms. Furness, you don't have any further questions. I do not, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Van Ness. Mr. Kutztrotter, thank you again for coming to the Commission and uh, giving evidence. I know that we have trespassed on your uh, time quite considerably, but we appreciate the assistance you have provided to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Good to see you again. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Dr. Melifont, uh, it is now um, 25 uh, uh, minutes to one your time and 25 minutes to two. Sydney time, when should we adjourn to? Well, um, we are entirely in your hands. The, what remains to be done are the tender cleanup uh, part of the session and the closings. We're in a position to proceed now or after lunch. It might be sensible to take an adjournment uh, I suggest that we resume at uh, 1.30 your time, 2.30 Sydney time. Is that convenient? Yes. Good. Yes, thank, thank you. Right. Yes, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, uh, I understand Mr. Power is going to tender some documents, or are you going to do that, Melifont? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Power will tender some documents, and then I'll ask for some directions, please. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, there are a number of remaining documents from this hearing that we'll seek to tender. What is <laughs> proposed with uh, your consent is that uh, I will identify each of the documents and what their proposed exhibit numbers are, and then at the conclusion of the reading of that list, I will seek an honour. Uh, I will seek an order that they be tendered and marked as exhibits <coughs> with the numbers that have been identified. Certainly. Um, first, uh, the transcript of Geoffrey Thomas's pre-recorded video statement is at tab nine of tender bundle A, and its proposed exhibit number is exhibit 11.28.11. The second written statement of Helen Sears is at tab 12 of tender bundle B2. Its proposed exhibit number is exhibit 11.28.11. Point five, point two. There are two written statements 
of the Honourable <laughs> Natasha Files MP at tabs 9 and 11 of Tender Bundle C. The proposed exhibit numbers for those are exhibits 11.20.1 and 11.20.4, respectively. A statement of David Manchester contained attachments uh, which are at tabs one and two of Tender Bundle D1. Uh, those attachments uh, will have the proposed exhibit markings 11.7.3 and 11.7.4. A notice to produce VIC-NTP-000010, which was referred to in the written statement of Michael Harlem Bullis at tab 91 in tender bundle D2, will have the proposed exhibit number 11.25.5. The CV of Megan Osborne is at tab 1 and a response by the Office of the Public Guardian to statements of Dr Ellis in relation to the seclusion of Melanie is at tab three of Tender Bundle E. The proposed exhibit markings are exhibit 11.2.2 and 11.2.4 respectively. A floor plan of the seclusion unit attached to the statement of Megan Osborne is at tab two of Tender Bundle E. The proposed exhibit marking is exhibit 11.2.3. Ms Osborne's response to responses to questions on notice arising from her evidence at the Royal Commission are at tab 26 of Tender Bundle E and the proposed exhibit marking is exhibit 11.2.5. Attachments to uh, Minister Files' written statements are at tabs 23, 24 and 30 of Tender Bundle E. The proposed exhibit markings are exhibits 11.20.2, 11.20.3 and 11.20.5 respectively. Policy documents referred to in Professor Stoddard's written statement are at tabs 27 to 29 of Tender Bundle E. The proposed exhibit markings for those documents are exhibits 11.18.7 to 11.18.9, respectively. The documents in the, the Melanie case study are at tabs 1 to 83 of Tender Bundle F1. The proposed exhibit markings for those uh, 83 documents are 11.1.3 to 11.1.85. A second chronology that has been prepared of the Melanie case study, which includes a disclaimer, is at tab 84 of Tender Bundle F1. The proposed Exhibit marking is Exhibit 11.1.87. Documents for the Win Marti case study are at tabs 3 to 136 of Tender Bundle F2. The proposed exhibit markings are Exhibits 11.35.11 to 11.35.144. The documents related to the CIDP case study and systemic failures generally are at tabs 1 to 17 of Tender Bundle F3. Tab 11 has already been tendered um, and so it will be tabs 1 to 10 and 12 to 17 and I ask that they be given uh, exhibit markings and I may just have to, sorry I apologize I'll just have to check on that sorry um, 
Chair, while well, that's uh, just being checked, the exhibit markings for uh, for all of the exhibits except for that last one, which I will reread into the record. Um, I seek that those documents be tendered into evidence and given the exhibit markings that have been read out. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, that will be done. And of course, the exhibit markings will be on the transcript. So uh, those markings can be allocated to each of the exhibits as you have indicated. Uh, might I just ask a, a question, Mr. Power, just to check something. Yes. You've referred to a chronology for Melanie's case, which is exhibit 11.1.87. Uh, there is also a chronology, is there not, for Win Marty's case? Has that has that been tendered? Tendered in F one two. It it has chair and it is uh, tendered as part of F point two. Uh, Tab sixteen. Tab sixteen. Well, that's all right. If it if it's been tended and has an exhibit number, that it does. Right. Yes, yes, I that's okay. check, check that. And the other thing I wanted to check: reference has been made to the summaries that have been prepared within the Royal Commission of themes and recommendations in previous reports. Have, have those documents been tendered? Yes. yes, yes, Chair, they have. All right, so they're already in evidence. Thank you. They are. Yes. Uh, so if I can just return to the final uh, exhibit uh, or proposed exhibit, it was uh, the documents related to the CIDP case study and systemic failures generally, which are at uh, tabs 1 to 10 and 12 to yeah. 7, 17 of tender bundle F3. And I'd ask that they be uh, tendered into evidence and given the exhibit numbers 11.36.1 to 11.36.37. Yes, that can be done as well. Oh, sorry, I apologise, I misread it. 11.36.1 uh, to 11.36.17. One set. All right, that can be done in place for Thank you. what was said previously. All right, <laughs> thank you very much. No doubt we'll be able to read all those documents uh, by about 3.30. Yes. No doubt. Uh, may we ask for some directions in the following terms, please? Number one, for any witness who took questions on notice, though those witnesses should provide their targeted and concise answers to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Commission by 12 March 2021. Any party wishing to make submissions or provide evidence as to why any certain exhibits, including statements which have been or will be tendered, should not be published in accordance with practice guideline four, should provide concise submissions and supporting evidence in relation to any claim to office of to the Office of Solicitor Assisting by 12 March 2021, so that the commissioners may consider these claims. Number three. Parties in receipt of procedural fairness correspondence should provide any targeted and concise submissions along with any additional material for the Commissioner's consideration to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 12 March 2021. Council assisting the Royal Commission will consider any additional material produced and determine if any additional steps need to be taken and by 19 March Council assisting will tender into evidence whatever additional materials are considered appropriate in accordance with practice guideline four. Number five, council assisting will then prepare written submissions for the Royal Commission, which will be made available on a confidential basis to those parties with leave to appear on a date to be advised. Number six, parties with leave to appear who wish to make submissions in response will be given an opportunity to do so in a time frame that will be advised by the Office of Solicitor Assisting in due course. Seven and finally, following consideration of council assisting submissions, along with any submissions received in response, the four Royal Commissions who have sat at this hearing will prepare a short report on the hearing and such report will be made public in due course. Of course, the last is not a direction that needs to be made, but just an indication of the intention of the Commission. <coughs> 
it is in fact a helpful suggestion. They are the, yeah. they are the order sort, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Melifont, uh, have these been discussed uh, with Ms. Furness and uh, uh, Ms. McMillan? I'm not sure whether Ms. McMillan is present today. The, the, these proposed uh, directions were sent by email at 6.51 p.m. yesterday, and I haven't received any objections, well, as it were, from, from any well, party. Thank you for that. Well, in, in the absence of uh, any indication to the contrary, then I'll make the directions that have been uh, read out by Dr. Melifont and, uh, of course, the terms of the directions are available or will be available uh, with the transcript of the hearing. Thank you. We move now to clo the closing um, address by council assisting, which will be delivered by Mr Power and by myself, Mr Power, to start. Thank you. Yes, Mr Power. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, in closing this hearing, we want to thank all of the witnesses who participated over the course of the hearing. But we particularly want to thank the five witnesses who spoke of their lived experiences as people with disabilities. Melanie, Dorothy Armstrong, Geoffrey Thomas, Taylor Burden, and Justin Thomas. We also want to thank Auntie Margaret Campbell, Laurel Stockell, and Patrick McGee, who told part of Win Marty's story. And we want to thank Win Marty for allowing his artwork to be shown during the course of the evidence. One of his paintings was of his favourite places and animals at Alice Well, his home country. And what can be seen is the uh, stockyards and the, and the windmills, which were described as his favourite place to sit and watch uh, the cattle and the other animals at, at uh, Alice Well. So... We started this hearing with evidence from Melanie and part of what Melanie said was, quote, when I was in seclusion for eight years, not one day of my life that I didn't want to get out and have a life and be happy on the ward. But then the kindness of nurses in the forensic hospital got me out after eight years. When I, was, when I got put in seclusion, it was, I didn't know that I would ever come out of seclusion. I was like thinking, you know what? I got no light at the end of the tunnel. I don't see any light. Where is the light? Then we concluded this hearing on the final day with the beginning with the evidence of Justin Thomas. He spoke of being homeless as a teenager with cognitive disability and being imprisoned. He said that because of his homelessness, eventually I was charged with trespassing and ended up escalating a lot of fines and I couldn't deal with my fines and they found a reason to lock me up, to lock me up for fines, unpaid fines, and that, that made me a lot worse. Inside me, my tra trauma was getting worse. And a lot of times I've been remanded in custody because I didn't have a place to go and a home address. However, Justin's story is also about his resilience and his success in changing his life with the support of some key people who he acknowledged. And he said that a program like the CDPP, CIDP. sorry, CIDP, helps people with disability live their potential instead of seeing them go to jail and locking them away. From all of the evidence heard, several themes have emerged from this hearing. The first, there is no doubt that people with cognitive disability and particularly First Nations people with cognitive disability are overrepresented in the justice system. Two, early intervention and the provision of disability su appropriate support at all stages of the criminal justice system may operate to reduce that overrepresentation. We note that we heard striking examples from Professor Baldry about the economic cost benefits of early intervention and support for people with disabilities 
who are otherwise likely to be imprisoned or hospitalised. Three, there is a need for much more early intervention and much more disability appropriate supports and culturally appropriate supports at all stages of the criminal justice system. Four, programs and services that address the needs of people with cognitive disability can result in cost savings over the life course of a person with disability and provide several benefits to the community, not least of which is the reduction in recidivism. Five, the short-term funding of programs and services makes it difficult to build institutional knowledge and affect lasting change. Six, forensic orders for people with cognitive disability who are found unfit to be tried or not guilty by reason of mental impairment need to be therapeutic rather than punitive and to have transparent, accessible systems of review. Seven, the solitary confinement of people with cognitive disability is significantly more likely to cause harm than good. Long-term solitary confinement is no solution to caring for a person with disability who has complex needs. Mm -hmm. Eight, there is a lack of usable, adequately disaggregated data about people with disability across all areas of the criminal justice system. And nine, as a result of that lack of data, there is limited targeted research with respect to people with cognitive disability and First Nations people with cognitive disability in the criminal justice system. The evidence in this hearing has identified significant and confronting issues for people with disability interacting with the criminal justice system, both as victims and as offenders. We have heard, however, from people with disability who have managed to come through these challenges and to become powerful advocates for change. Dorothy Armstrong, amongst other things, her advocacy with CIJ included speaking to magistrates about how confronting courts were for her as a person with a significant trauma history and an acquired brain injury. Geoffrey Thomas, he has become involved as, a, as the chair of the residence committee of his public housing complex and involved in the tending to the common garden area. Taylor Burden, her advocacy with IDRS has included speaking to prison officers about how she experienced prison and the difference that a positive prison guard made to her life. Justin Taylor, Thomas. sorry, I apologize, Justin Thomas, his advocacy included speaking to the UN on behalf of First Nations people with disability. In addition to that evidence, we want to highlight and acknowledge the other voices we have heard from people who are committed to the advocacy and support of persons with a disability when confronting the criminal justice system. We also want to acknowledge the important contribution of the expert witnesses and to thank them for their continued research and their suggestions from change. The Royal Commission encourages those involved or following the public hearings to seek support if they feel they need to in response to the confronting issues that we heard in this hearing. We again note that the following supports are available. The Royal Commission has an internal counselling and support service team made up of social workers and counsellors who can provide counselling and support to people engaging with the Commission. The Australian Government has also funded the Blue Knot Foundation, a specialist counselling support and referral service for people with disability, their families and carers, and anyone affected by the Commission. Their hotline number is 1800 421 468. 
a range of legal and advocacy services have been funded by the Australian government. There is legal financial assistance to assist meeting the costs of legal representation associated with formal engagement with the Commission. National Legal Aid and the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services also deliver free advisory services for people engaging with the Commission. Further information about these services can be found on the Commission's website or by contacting the information line 1800 517 199. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Power. Yes, Dr. Melifont. <clears throat> on behalf of Council, may I express our sincere gratitude for the work of all of those that have contributed and worked so very hard for and at this hearing. The hearing is, of course, the culmination of work, of the work of staff across the entire Commission, engagement, counselling, interpreting and translation, media, data research and publications, corporate services, law and order, executive assistants and associates. And, of course, there is the hearing team within the Office of Solicitor Assisting under the leadership for this particular hearing of Ms Peterswold, Ms Dobby and Ms Mr Marcus, and policy under the leadership of Ms Scott and Ms Coronius. As to hearing and logistics, I think I can safely say that I am not alone in my abundant gratitude for the truly exemplary leadership of Ms Michelle Corcoran. Finally, may I acknowledge the immeasurable help and contribution of my co-counsel, Ms Crawford, Mr Power and Ms Tarago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Melifont. The opening uh, statements of this uh, public hearing 11 explain the purposes of the hearing and set the context for our examination of the interaction between people with cognitive disability and the criminal justice system. I do not want to repeat anything that was said in the openings. It is necessary only to add that this eight day hearing has amply demonstrated that the expression criminalization of disability is an apt description of the treatment of so many people with cognitive disability by and in the criminal justice system. Council assisting um, Mr. Power just now has identified a number of themes that have emerged from the evidence at this hearing. And again, I do not want to repeat what Mr. Power has said. However, the themes identified bear on the questions that were also identified in the openings. In many ways, the most telling material to emerge from this hearing are the chronologies that record in truncated form the life histories of Melanie and Wynne Marty. I will not comment on who, if anyone, bears responsibility for the treatment each has received over so many years. That may or may not be the subject of submissions and uh, may have to be dealt with in a report. What is incontrovertible is that both Melanie and Wynne Marty have endured conditions to which no person in Australia should ever be subjected, let alone people who are not actually serving a sentence of imprisonment for a criminal offence of which they have been convicted. In 2003, a judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales characterised the conditions under which Melanie was then detained as inhumane in the extreme. A little earlier, a tribunal described the conditions of Melanie's confinement in a male prison, where she was at the time, as degrading and humane. The Royal Commission will no doubt hear submissions as to whether the conditions Melanie has been under for a long period since she was transferred from the, uh, from the male prison warrant the same description. It is difficult to believe that well into the 21st century in this country, someone with a severe cognitive disability should have been subjected to the regime of seclusion and physical restraint that Melanie has experienced. 
In 2014, the Australian Human Rights Commission recorded a concession made by the Commonwealth, by the Australian government, that when Marty had been subject to the most severe treatment while in prison, including frequent use of physical, mechanical and chemical restraints, seclusion and shackles when outside his cell. The commission found that the conditions of detention experienced by Win Marty amounted to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment contrary to Article 15 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. We heard uh, during the last uh, week or so, a good deal of evidence concerning Win Marty's treatment in the years after the Human Rights Commission's report was published, but I don't today want to preempt any submissions that might address the way in which that treatment should be described. What can be said is that if anybody doubts or has doubted the validity of the concept of intersectionality, that is the cumulative forms of disadvantage, which so many First Nations people with disability experience, the cases of Melanie and Win Marty provide irrefutable proof. As uh, Dr. Melifont uh, has done, I want to thank all the witnesses who have given evidence at this hearing in one form or another. I particularly wish to express on behalf of the commissioners our appreciation to witnesses who have had direct experience of a period in custody as the result of their involvement in the criminal justice system. Mr. Power just now recounted an extract from Melanie's recorded statement with which the evidence at this hearing commenced. After all that Melanie has been through, it is remarkable that she retains hope and wants to reach the light at the end of the exceedingly dark tunnel in which the system placed her. With appropriate support, she has the determination to overcome the obstacles that the system has placed in that dark tunnel and to reach the light. Her story is a reminder that should be completely unnecessary but is in fact necessary, that people locked away in seclusion have rights, they have human rights, and they deserve to be treated with respect and dignity and to receive the support they need to realise their full potential. We did not hear directly from Win, uh, Win Marty, who was in hospital at the time evidence was given concerning his case, although, as we've seen, we have been provided with examples of his very colourful work, artwork. However, we did hear from Auntie Margaret Campbell about Win Marty's deep connection with country and culture. As Commissioner Atkinson remarked during the hearing, it was wonderful to hear Auntie Margaret give evidence in the Pijajara language with the excellent assistance of Auntie Della Pierce acting as interpreter. I do not know whether this is the first time evidence has been given to a royal commission in the Pigeon Tajara language. As it happens, however, it is not the first time I've heard evidence given in that language. Nearly two decades ago, I spent six weeks in Uluru hearing a native title compensation claim, and much of the, language, much of the evidence at that hearing was given either in the Pigeon Tajara or Yankana Tajara languages. I had the privilege at that time of being taken to numerous sites of great spiritual significance in and around Uluru and Katachuta and well beyond. It was a moving and unforgettable experience. The only downside is that it required travel in a helicopter and I had just completed a helicopter crash case shortly before the hearing in Uluru. Today, I want to add my thanks uh, uh, to those of uh, Dr. Melifont for Ms. Sturkel and Mr. McGee for their part in telling Win Marty's story. I want to express special appreciation to the witnesses who've been prepared to tell us or let, or let us or let their stories be told, stories that are harrowing and relate to their experiences with the criminal justice system. 
We are very grateful to Melanie and Wynne Marty for allowing their stories to be told. Ms. Dorothy Armstrong told us of the relationship between being the victim of terrible violence and abuse and becoming enmeshed in the criminal justice system and then being able to overcome those difficulties uh, with uh, appropriate assistance. We heard from Mr. Jer Jeffrey Thomas, who told us about the cycle of incarceration that could have been avoided had he received as a child and young person the support that should be the birthright of every Australian, but especially First Nations people. Mr. Justin Thomas's story shows the links between homelessness and the criminal justice system and the consequences of the system failing to recognize intellectual disability or the consequences of trauma. Here is someone who has spent time in prison, but who has become an effective advocate, has represented advocacy organizations, and has addressed the United Nations to speak on behalf of his indigenous brothers and sisters with disability. We heard and saw from Ms. Taylor Boudin, who explained how the provision of support through CIDP turned her life around. Had that support been available earlier, it is highly unlikely that Ms. Boudin would ever have found her way into custody. As she said, because if I was in the prison system still, I wouldn't have this support now and I'd be sitting there screwed. And that worries me, that worries. Because like how many other people are still in there that needs to be on the program, that could be out, not in, the interviewer, and they just don't know about it, Ms. Boudin, and they just don't know about it or it just doesn't exist. So really, I would like to get something back into the system. This hearing has shown, as was foreshadowed at the outset, that there is no shortage of worthwhile approaches to end the cycle created by the criminalization of disability. The difficulty is to ensure that effective programs are introduced, supported, and properly funded, and not just in the short term. I want to conclude by expressing on behalf of the commissioners our deep gratitude to the skilled and dedicated staff of the Royal Commission who together with our indefatigable council led by Dr. Melifont and the hearing team, they've worked so hard to compile and present such powerful evidence over eight days of hearings. It's not easy for people outside the Royal Commission to appreciate just how challenging it is to prepare a hearing such as this. It is an enormous and difficult undertaking and we owe a great deal to everyone who has contributed to such an important part of the Royal Commission's work. On behalf of the commissioners, I endorse Dr. Melifont's expression of thanks to everybody who has played their part in ensuring that this hearing can take place. The commissioners also wish to thank Mr. Ben Fogarty of Council for so ably and sensitively assisting witnesses to give evidence, and Mr. Michael Baker from the Intellectual Disability Rights Service for supporting the witnesses. We also thank Stride for supporting Mr. Thomas in his interview with Mr. Fogarty. It is rather sobering to recall that this has been our 11th public hearing, each of which has presented similar challenges for the teams in the Royal Commission. Today is Thursday, we resume next Tuesday, when we shall be hearing further evidence from public hearing 10, education and training of the health professionals in relation to people with cognitive disability. Idleness is not an option. We'll adjourn the hearing. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. <laughs>